my name's Darren Jones. Uh, I'm the VP of uh, VLSI at Esperanto, which just means I'm the uh, I'm the chip guy, or my team is in charge of all of the chips that we uh, that we do here at Esperanto. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm glad you're here uh, on this uh, last week of the year. We were um, uh, not sure how many people we would get to this, but we actually got quite a few. So so glad you guys are all here. Uh, hopefully on a slow day or, and a slow week uh, to catch up. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Esperanto and go into a little bit of detail about our um, our technology. Um, the reason I'm doing this is that, frankly, uh, we're hiring, and we're hiring a lot of people, and we're hiring wor worldwide. So I want you guys to get a general idea of the company. If you're at all interested, I'll give you some, um, some names and some email addresses uh, at, at the end. For, uh, for taking next steps. Uh, all right, so with that, uh, and we will have some time for uh, questions at the end if you have any. So uh, if you think of something, uh, yeah, uh, be prepared. All right, thanks. Now, how do I get it to go forward? There we go. All right, I'll, the other thing I'll say is that I'm not familiar with uh, this software, GoToWebinar. Uh, hopefully it works like every other sort of Zoomish uh, software and I'll figure it out. So. Uh, bear with me in case it's a little bit clunky. Um, so what is Esperanto? If you guys have done a little bit of homework, uh, you'll know that, that uh, all of our technology is based on RISC-V. So, um, uh, and we are at heart kind of a CPU company, although we are much more than hardware. We are hardware and software. and We're providing a solution for machine learning uh, and specifically our first product, which I'll talk a little bit about, is uh, for data center inferencing. Um, however, as, you'll, as, I'll, as I'll talk, it actually scales very well um, down into, say, edge applications uh, as well as cloud. So our founder, Dave Ditzel, is a, a, an industry veteran. He started multiple companies. Um, in fact, he um, published the, the very first um, paper on uh, RISC CPUs back when he was uh, a PhD student at, at Berkeley. Uh, and he brings with him uh, a strong uh, technical team here at Esperanto. Uh, so it's a veteran group, very traditional Silicon Valley startup, um, a lot of senior people with a lot of um, seniors, uh, a lot of good skills. Um, our RISC-V engine is now, I can say, silicon proven. We have silicon in the lab, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I even have a couple of pictures for you guys. Uh, and we have been involved with RISC-V from the, from the very beginning. And in fact, some of the things that we're doing are going back into the RISC-V uh, community as well. Like I said, Cloud Edge, I think we've got something that's pretty special here. And I'm going to talk about it, over 1,000 uh, RISC-V processors on a chip. We're targeting machine learning, but frankly, uh, it's very exciting because many of the things that we've done enable general purpose processing with many cores. Uh, so it does scale um, both to larger data center uh, kind of workloads as well as for something that's a little bit more cost effective down to edge devices. And one of our uh, claims to fame is frankly power efficiency. So even though we've got a thousand RISC-V cores, when those are all operating uh, on some key recommendation uh, machine learning workloads, we're uh, under 20 watts, and in some cases comfortably, significantly under 20 watts. So that's uh, one of the things. In fact, when I go to a uh, cocktail party and talk to friends, they say, 1,000 cores, that's interesting. And then I say, 20 watts. And they're like, what? That's crazy. You can't run 1,000 cores in 20 watts. Well, we can, and I'll talk a little bit about what, what we do to, to get that. Um, so we've kind of been in stealth mode for a while. Um, however, this year has been a little bit of our coming out party. So we've been presenting at, at various places and getting a lot of positive press. So this is just a, you know, a snapshot of the kinds of um, uh, news that, that we're, we're generating. And in fact, some of the slides that I'm talking about here today, I've pulled from these other uh, technical presentations. Um, so I thought I'd start, uh, I think most of you are probably engineers, 
Um, I, I think there's probably a mix of hardware and software people out there. Um, but let's give an overview of our first product, which we call the ETSOC1. Uh, Dave says that SOC stands for supercomputer on a chip, although it is also a system on a chip. And the one is because it's our first. Uh, ET is Esperon Technologies, obviously. So it's a big chip. It's a seven nanometer chip, um, over 500 square millimeters, and uh, 24 billion transistors. So this is, you know, this is NVIDIA class uh, size uh, of a chip. This is, even though we're a relatively small startup, um, uh, we, we've done something pretty special here. Uh, uh, it has over 1,000 of, of these RISC-V processors. We call them ET minions. They are energy efficient, but they are not underpowered. These are full 64-bit uh, compliant RISC-V processors, and in fact, each one is, multi, is dual threaded. Um, and furthermore, each one of those has an attached um, vector tensor unit, which is what we use to accelerate machine learning workloads. Uh, the typical operation there is a pretty wide range, 500 megahertz all the way up to 1.5 gigahertz, uh, and that was on purpose. It's a wide range on purpose because we want to be able to tune the voltage and tune the frequency to stay within whatever your power envelope is, So, if, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's an advantage for us uh, in the next uh, slide or two. Um, so those are our efficiency cores, the ET minions, but we also have a high performance out of order core, which we call ET Maxion in a four core cluster. Uh, and uh, one of the exciting things is we are, uh, we are uh, building up the ET Maxion team. Uh, so there's lots of positions for those of you who may be uh, interested in high performance uh, CPU design. Uh, we have a lot of on-chip SRAM, over 160 megabytes, um, and access to up to 32 gigs of external DRAM, and that's per chip. And as, you, as, a, as you'll see soon, uh, we can actually gang these chips together and get uh, larger amounts of uh, off-chip storage uh, because, frankly, machine learning workloads are very large. They require a lot of memory, and um, frankly, they are getting larger. Uh, they're getting larger significantly and very quickly. So it's good to have uh, large amounts of memory. Uh, we are fully secure. Obviously, this is a data center chip, so we need to have the root of trust. And like I said, power can be uh, less than 20 watts, although if I wanted to dial up the performance and, and I have additional power, I can, I can dial that up. Um, and you can see there in the lower right-hand corner, uh, is a picture, this is in our Mountain View lab. It's hard to tell, but there's a big fan on that board, uh, and underneath that fan is our chip. Uh, at 20 watts, we probably don't need the fan, but it's a bring-up board, so frankly, better safe than sorry. So uh, we've, got a, we've got that. Uh, it is running real machine workloads uh, on all 1,000 cores, uh, and we're getting the performance that we expected uh, both on ResNet 50 and, frankly, a little bit better than what we expected currently on, on DLRM, which is a recommendation workload. ResNet 50, by the way, is kind of a, a little bit of the dry stone of the machine learning day. It's, it's, a, it's a very relatively simple uh, workload. It does do real computation, but it's not generally used in any kind of um, actual workloads today, whereas recommend recommendation systems like DLRM are much more important to uh, most customers, and that's where we really shine. Okay, uh, so this is, I'm not gonna go into all of this, it's a little bit of a wordy slide, but um, because each of our chips are very low power, uh, we can actually put more than one chip together to give incredible DRAM bandwidth and incredible DRAM uh, capacity. So the the other guys, the competition tends to have one big chip that uses up the entire power budget, and that that power budget is typically 100 to 120 watts. That's a PCIe uh, typical uh, power form factor. So uh, and furthermore, they have fewer cores. So they might have 10 to 20 cores on their one big chip. We've got over a thousand, and if each one of those is less than 20, we can put six on a board, still be within our 120 watt power envelope, and now I've got 
6,000 cores and 12,000 uh, threads uh, of performance. And each one of those has an attached uh, a, a tensor vector accelerator. The, re the way we can do this, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to talk about uh, Maxian first. I'm going to talk about how we get that low power in a second. But I first want to talk about our Maxian uh, high performance core. It is uh, an out of order uh, uh, four uh, in instructions per cycle core. Um, and we are significantly revamping this. So if you're in at all interested in working on a high performance out of order core, uh, now is a great opportunity to get in at the beginning of the project. So uh, uh, we're especially looking at uh, improving the uh, load store unit. So uh, I'm not going to go into all of these details here. Um, it also has a pretty wide operating range, 500 up to 2 gig, and we are looking to improve that in the second generation. All right, so let's talk about those minions and how we get um, to such low power. So like I said, 120 watts is the typical power envelope. Um, if you were really just going for maximum performance on a single chip, you could run it at, you know, point, point 0.9 volts, uh, which would be way beyond your power budget, 275 watts. Even at the nominal uh, voltage for 7 nanometer, which is 0.75, you're, you're at 164 watts in just a single chip. If you needed to be within your 120 on a single chip, then you're at about 0.65 or a little less voltage. Uh, and that's where typically everybody else is. They're in that 0.65 to 0.75 range. Um, but if you really lower the voltage, you get the advantage in power of V squared, right? So uh, it does lower your performance because, of course, you have to bring the frequency down, but the frequency comes down basically linearly. So from a power efficiency point of view, you get you really get the advantage of V squared here. So if you wanted to run all the way down to approximately 300 millivolts, uh, you could be uh, under 10 watts in a single chip. So if you put six of them together, you're still around 50 watts or so. Um, but my power envelope is 120, so why don't I just... Uh, uh, that, that actually by the way, gives you uh, better performance because I've got six chips. But if I crank the voltage up just a little bit more, up to about 400 millivolts, uh, now I can be 20 watts per chip, six chips, that's 120 watts, and I'm still getting uh, much better performance and lower power, right? So that's our sweet spot. So that's part of uh, what what we're doing, we're operating at, at very low voltages. We have some tricks of the trade that we do there, but frankly, it's nothing crazy risky. It's uh, and we aren't near threshold. This is not threshold near threshold design. It's not esoteric, academic stuff. And as I said, we have silicon working in the lab today uh, at uh, these kinds of voltages. Um, Again, I've, I've sort of lifted these slides uh, from some other things, so I'm not going to go into all this detail because I don't, I don't want to bore you guys too much. But this is basically a picture on the right of our minion core. And it, this, even though this is kind of a block diagram, it's area-wise about right. So the, 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 let me call your attention first to the yellow RISC-V integer pipeline. That is basically the fully compliant 64-bit uh, RISC-V engine. It's got some uh, cache around it, and, but the top two-thirds or so is this vector tensor accelerator unit. We support both uh, floating point as well as integer multiply accumulates, and as well as some uh, vector transcendental instructions, and that's important for uh, machine learning. Uh, I tell you that because then once I have one of those, in each one of these eight core clusters, which we call a neighborhood, uh, then there's uh, that is shared. It has a shared I cache there. And we put four of those neighborhoods together into what we call a shire or a minion shire. And that's connected to a large amount of on-chip memory, which can be configured by software as L2 cache or L3 cache or on-chip uh, scratch pad. Um, 
All of this goes together here. This looks similar to our uh, black diagram. The purple is basically a 2D mesh where each one of these shires can talk to each other. Up here we have our I.O. functions as well as our high performance Maxian core. And then we have eight different um, what we call memory shires, which each of them have two channels to uh, off-chip uh, LP DDR4X. So you might ask, uh, okay, that's interesting. You guys can tile a bunch of uh, processors together. Uh, and that's right, that's, that's actually no small achievement. But the trick is how does software take advantage of, of this kind of many core parallelism? And that's actually the trick. Um, so I'm going to give you one example. There's several things that we've done here. Um, so we have, we've added some instructions uh, where we can, uh, it's, it's frankly, a lot of it is about the memory subsystem and memory movement. So we have an instruction called TensorLoad L2 Scratchpad, which transfers data from off-chip memory into uh, the on-chip memory. Um, inside the minion shire then, that's where it's getting deposited into the L2 cache there, but I still need it to be closer to the processor, right? So now I have a, a second uh, operation called tensor load, which will move that data from the L2 into the individual minions that need to uh, access that data. Inside that minion then, uh, I will do my uh, uh, tensor floating point multiply accumulate, which is now moving data from the L1 into the vector tensor unit and now accessing the uh, vector register file. So it's very, very efficient. Uh, and in fact, I can't remember. Yeah, so I think, uh, I don't know if I can do this, yes. So um, in fact, we also have operations which will do up to, I believe, 16,000 of these multiply accumulates with one instruction. So this is very, very power efficient. It means that uh, then the, the RISC-V integer pipeline can shut down uh, while the uh, tensor accelerator is running 16,000 of these operations. Um, furthermore, with that one instruction, I'm getting 100% utilization of my multiply accumulates. And it works because I've moved the data uh, close to those uh, processing units. So I, I mention all this because, you know, it's not just CPU design, it's also SOC design, it's also about the software that runs on this. Um, Esperanto is really trying to solve a larger problem here. Um, and in fact, what we see is that in the olden days when, um, you know, Sun or MIPS or ARM, you could just deliver more processing performance. And because their customers had GCC and because their customers had Linux, pretty much you could take advantage of that processing. But you can't do that when you have many, many cores, right? You have to think about the software. So uh, this is a little bit of a summary slide on, on the technology, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the company. So basically, our low-voltage technology is, is one of our key differentiators. That's what enables us to be such low power um, and yet deliver the performance. Right? Um, we, because uh, we, have, we are RISC-V compliant, uh, it's very, very general purpose. Yes, the vector tensor unit itself is targeted for machine learning applications, but frankly, the, all of the things that we've done uh, with the memory subsystem, and there's a lot of things that I haven't talked about, like atomic operations and coordination instructions that enable the, the minion cores to operate efficiently together. All of that's pretty general purpose. Um, so it, it's very efficient uh, processor, and like I said, the status is we've got silicon, it's in the lab, it's up and running, um, and uh, furthermore, we've, we've started with customer demos, and that's been very well received running actual workloads, ResNet 50 and uh, DLRM. So I want to talk a little bit about the culture. So for me, um, you know, I, I want to work at a company where I enjoy coming into work, I respect the people, um, and I feel like my contributions are valued. And I think that's the case for literally everyone at Esperanto from the CEO on down. It's definitely a startup culture. 
um, which I find very exciting. You know, I think in Silicon Valley, it's it's been great, frankly, with machine learning. There's there's been a renaissance of of startups. Um, for a long time before that, um, startups were a little getting a little bit harder to find. Um, and part of that startup culture is that everybody is important. You're not going to get pigeonholed doing just one thing. Or, and if you want to fix something, you're likely your manager is likely to say, "Yeah, go do it. That's a great idea." Right? Nobody's going to hold you back. Um, we work very efficiently. Um, you know, I think we've all been thrown into it here with the pandemic. Um, um, our policy is we are very flexible from a working environment. Frankly, we were that way before because of our worldwide workforce. Um, you'll see in a minute we have offices in Europe as well as here in uh, the U.S. And these are not just satellite offices. They're, there's serious teams in each location. Therefore, we needed to be able to operate even when we weren't physically present with, with those other people. Now, with the pandemic, it's even true here in Mountain View with other people in Mountain View or in Barcelona, Spain with other people in Barcelona, Spain. So we've always been kind of flexible and hybrid, and I think now with the pandemic, we've 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 gotten even better at it. Um, Work-life balance uh, is is important. It's important to me, frankly. I think the nature of this job, uh, nature of doing chips, uh, is there's always a deadline, there's always a tape out, and frankly, those last couple of months before tape out are a little crazy. It's going to be hard work. But I try very hard to make sure that um, when it's not crunch time, uh, that we do have a, a very reasonable work-life balance. And I've worked in other companies where crunch time was just immediately followed by more crunch time. And frankly, I, I, that's too much. Um, you know, I think people need time to recharge so that they can be creative. What we do, even though it's engineering, we're creating something where there wasn't something before. That's creative. So I think that's important. Um, the organization it is not particularly hierarchical. It's very receptive. I think anybody at the company can throw a meeting on the CEO's calendar. He's busy, but he, he takes those meetings. Um, or the VP or whoever else, if you see something that you think could be improved or that you want to volunteer for, I think we're open. Right? So this is the kind of um, culture that we have. And I personally think the small company experience is really important. I've worked at big companies. Um, I've worked at small companies. I've worked at startups. I like the startup and the small company experience because, um, frankly, what you do matters. Um, and the, everybody else there is relying on you. And I, I like that feeling. So here's the call to action. Here's, here's, uh, here's a listing of our current open positions. Uh, there's a lot, both in hardware as well as software, as well as uh, systems engineering, IT. Um, and like I said, we have offices around the world. Uh, our office here in Silicon Valley is in Mountain View, although I think that um, not too many people go into the office these days. The lab guys do. Most of us, frankly, are working from home. Um, we have an office up in Portland and then in Europe, uh, Barcelona, Spain, as well as uh, in Serbia. So, uh, like I said, we are also flexible in terms of working from home. Um, I, personally, I prefer to be able to come into the office from time to time. Right now, I'm not doing that. Um, but depending on the job, you might, you might be able to work remotely um, almost all of the time. So, on our website, esperanto.ai slash careers is the full listing, and that's uh, where you can actually apply. Or you can send an email to jobs at esperanto.ai. And just in case, uh, for engineering, uh, here's my name. So our, our email addresses at Esperanto are the usual first name dot last name at esperanto.ai or esperanto.com. And so myself and Rohit are on here, as well as uh, Sue, our uh, HR person. All right, I think that that's it for my prepared remarks. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, I think there's a Q&A panel. I can see it. You can type it in there. Um, the question is, are you using a custom knock for data movement in Minion or a VIP like AXI? So, so this 
knock, the purple part, which talks between shires, is um, relatively custom. It is based on Axie, but it is not, not Axie. Um, inside the Shire is a custom interconnect between all of those. So this, this crossbar is more custom. Uh, this mesh stop uh, does talk out to the mesh. And actually, it is very, very much, I think I misspoke. I think it is actually Axie. Darren, another question. Um, what kind of work yeah. is done out of Portland, uh, Oregon office? So uh, the Portland office actually, uh, so I will say what they historically have done, but I'm also not necessarily, I like to run a team where people get a choice in what, what they're going to work on. So whenever we start a new project, you know, if you were the person who worked on the register file or you were the person who worked on the fetch unit and now you want to do something different, you will get that opportunity um, at Esperanto. Um, that being said, the, we have some really strong engineers up in Portland who uh, do, co they have done a coherent interconnect and they have uh, built basically this, what we call the Shire Cache interface, which includes this uh, crossbar interconnect and the banked memory that's configurable between L2, L3 and on chip scratch pad. Like any startup, I will also add they've done several other things because that's how startups work. Um, namely, uh, they took over the Memshire, uh, which is the DDR interface, uh, from another guy. So the Portland team is actually a, a very, it's a small but um, quite talented team. So if you're up in Portland, yeah, come join us. You'll learn a lot. Thank you guys for, for coming out on, your, uh, on, a, on a holiday week. And uh, please, like I said, I'll, I'll just page forward here. Uh, please come join us, uh, or at least take a look at uh, the, those job openings and send us an email. If you're at all interested, we can talk some more. All right, thank you very much.